this metaphysics of quality, it's actually hearkening back to something that a structure that exists in many ancient texts, including the Bible, where the actual the symbolic language of cosmology is often analyzable at multiple layers. So for instance, in the Bible, it talks a lot about heaven and earth. And we think, okay, heaven, some place that we don't know where it is, and earth is this planet. But heaven and earth meant <laughs> it had multiple meanings, depending on what level of reality you're considering it through. And that's why these stories pack so much meaning, because it can tell you one story, but it is applicable to multiple layers. So heaven and earth could mean, um, I mean, I have these exactly right, but like the principle and then the action that actually manifests the principle or mind and matter or even a leader and the community. So it's kind of like the, the impetus to do something, the organizing principle, and then the actual action of, uh, of manifestation or substantiation. So this, um, this book is actually pointing to the fractal structure of reality through a metaphysical descriptor in the same way that a book like the Bible points to the metaphysical structure of reality through symbolic descriptors. Yes, 100%. And one of the things that I've found most exciting and when we've had conversations in the past is, is a strong belief that the whole point of cultural evolution is to assimilate the you know, the, the valuable things that have been created by our ancestors, assimilate those things, upgrade them, um, expand upon them, fix them where they're broken, update, you know, we're in a constant baton race of, you know, handing on the, the flame as it were. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the metaphysics of quality becomes a new skeleton key through which many other um, subjects such as theology, mythology, the Bible, Mm -hmm. can be given a whole new lease of life which which yes. like are not not ironically which frees them from the static interpretations that have yes. devalued them over the last few thousand years because the only thing that's stopping biblical mythology and peterson jvp has 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 demonstrated this the last five years is all of this potential value is within those scriptures mm -hmm. but it all comes down to the means by which you interpret them so that yeah. they become understandable at multiple levels of analysis. And in other words, new meta structures need to be developed to free that material from static prisons that right. limit their exposure. And I think the leader does that. Yeah, know? yeah, it's, it's this, um, which is interesting because the I message to see the other day, I heard it on a Peterson podcast that logos actually entails the gathering together of things under a common name. Um, so it's as if this metaphysics is bringing together, you know, morality, theology, evolution, you know, science more broadly under a single rubric so that we can break down the divisions that we have currently have between them, which are manifesting themselves as conflict in the world, right? This conflict between totalitarianism, relativism, you know, all of these things that, um, Think they live on an island this actually becomes one element of a broader whole something you just said sparked some sparked a connection you mentioned the idea that this is all fractal there's four levels inorganic value or inorganic patterns of value which before we we recognize anything sentient in a biological sense so this is chemistry and the table of elements all interacting in space before any planets have formed and it's the forces that come with that. Uh, there's biological patterns of value, and that's when you start to see cellular um, consciousness starts to collaborate in communities that we call organisms. And then there's social patterns of values, which is when organisms uh, begin to collaborate in organisms that we call communities and yeah. societies. And then there's intellectual patterns of value, which is when those societies build ideas and principles and ethics and frameworks uh, uh, you know a framework for higher thinking which is yes. where we get scientific rationalism and science yes. and and that's the emergent property of of, of societies and yes. they all they all rely upon each other they're all yeah. inter interdependent um if if an intellectual idea destroys the society upon which it, it rests then 
it's self-defeating. Yes. And if the society um, which comes up with rules for communal guidelines, if they betray those individual. rules, yeah. it just exactly. And then yeah. and then you you go down the, the path of evolution. Yeah. So with that set up in mind, um, and each higher layer, just I'd say to keep in mind, is more transcendent of time, right? An idea is very it's timeless almost, so long as the structure is maintained. But uh, you know, at a lower level, say an organic level. Clearly, individual organisms live and die. Yes, and you could you could argue that the um, a coral like an actual something that you can correlate with um, you know one to one correlation is that the further up you go in the complexity of the evolutionary hierarchy, uh, the less um, the complex entity has uh, immediate time preference. It doesn't need right. Has a lower time away. preference as it ascends. Yeah. Yes. As it so so. Uh, let's take the idea of you know a gazelle on the on the, the plains uh, it responds only to um, high time preference stimuli which is oh, i'm going to eat this grass mm -hmm. and then it gets attacked by a lion and then it runs away and then within five seconds the gazelle has completely forgotten whatever the hell just happened it hasn't got a memory and it goes yeah. back to eating the grass yeah. so its life is trapped in a in a cycle of of high time preference activity of right. fear and consumption yeah and then by the time we get to humans, we've 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 through valuing, uh, let's say, principles of, of community and principles of economic um, efficiency, mm -hmm. we've effectively staved off the high time high time preference issues, yes. and given ourselves room for play. And play mm -hmm. is a you know extremely valuable asset for expanding even more time preference or mm -hmm. gaining ourselves more more freedom from yes. the limitations of time preference or high yes. time preference. So those four categories are exhaustive, inorganic patterns of value, uh, biological patterns of value, social patterns of value, and intellectual patterns of value. So and, and to, to chime in here, sorry to interrupt, but I just, I want to define fractal because this is a term that's thrown around a lot. Maybe people don't understand. So it's roughly the geometry of nature. So we don't see a lot of, um, you know, perfect rectangles or triangles. <laughs> floating around mm. in nature. There's not a lot of Euclidean geometry out here in, in the real world. Uh, fractal geometry is more like the jaggedness you associate with the coastline, um, just the irregularity of nature, effectively, the irregular geometry of nature. And it also tends to be self-similar at multiple levels. And it, and it unfolds in nearly repeating patterns. You know, they're not always identical necessarily, but they're, they're very self-similar. Uh, an example of this, the common example is the uh, Romanesco broccoli that looks like it's a tiny tree. And then each tree has a sprout of the same tree and it keeps having smaller sprouts all the way down. Trees themselves are pretty fractal. You know, they, they branch off and the branch branches off. Uh, you could even say, a pebble, a stone, and a mountain are kind of fractal. Like if you zoom in on any one of them, they have very similar patterns, but clearly they exist on much different scales. So this structure that we're describing, this metaphysical, even theological structure, which again, it's in the Bible as well, is describing this um, fractal structure of quality or value in, in existence or in being. Yeah, it's... It's it's staggering. Like even hearing you sort of say it like that feeds back into an example that I was going to use, which was was that in the inorganic pattern of values, when we had the void and you know post black black uh, big bang and mm -hmm. and matter is just flying around the universe and things are beginning to form, the the planets are formed by mass attracting itself to each other, and then when the planets all begin to settle in their, let's say, community of, of gravitational love, for the sake mm -hmm. of a better word, they're attracted to each other. They form uh, these larger and larger objects until they stabilize, this goes back to Bitcoin. They, the planets stabilize, and then once they stabilize on the surface, biological patterns start mm -hmm. to emerge on the surface. Right. And the biological patterns then create a, a fractal um, allowance for the attraction between biological entities to start communicating and collaborating. And then we get social patterns of value. Mm -hmm. The social patterns of value then start to communicate with each other and share cultural ideas. And then we get intellectual patterns of value. The, yeah. But 
But the irony is that going back to the logos, which is what you said, which is when ideas collect together under a, under a common, let's say, title, mm -hmm. just a conception that we use, well, that, that word, that the word, mm -hmm. is the same as the original inorganic patterns of value forming a planet, which is mass that has no, that has minimal significance in itself, accumulates until it becomes um, a center of, of gravity for mm -hmm. other things to emerge from it. And that's what yes. happens with Logos. Logos, when a word uh, has enough critical mass that it accumulates meaning in itself, then from that meaning that, that is the accumulation of all those values uh, in that word, that word then becomes a stepping stone for a new word, mm -hmm. which, is why, which is why etymology is effectively an alchemical mm -hmm. process, which is why all languages across the world are effectively trees. They yes. all go back to the root of Proto-Indo-European. Wow. So, so when you think about it, that the word of logos is is literally a tree. Like right. not not logos isn't literally meaning a tree, but yeah. language itself, the word that the Bible talks right. about, and logos language is, is fractal. What, language is fractal. Yeah, and etymology and, is walking backwards through the fractal. Yes, it's walking backwards through the fractal, and then yeah. when you get to the to the root of the the fractal of the language, yeah. then you end up finding yourself underground where the seeds of that fractal tree started yes. and underground where that intellectual pattern of value started yes. you're in the soil of the social patterns of value right. which is why jordan peterson talks explicitly about the idea that you cannot separate the intellectual value system from the underlying cultural value right, system right right because right because right, right. It, its roots are in the social patterns of value yes and the fractal emerges from it and then from those that tree of logos a new tier that we can't even imagine, a new dimension yes. will emerge from the branches of that tree. So it's a constant that's, fractal outgrowing. That's amazing. The symbolic language to describe, it's funny you talked about seed and tree because it describes, and again, heaven and earth, principle and matter. It describes the seed as a principle. And then the tree is the manifestation of the pattern encapsulated in the seed. So it's um, very fascinating. So pivoting back to the structure of Leela, we mentioned in the beginning that it is a fictional text interwoven with this non-fictional rigorous study of metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it would be helpful to give the audience a little bit of background. I guess I should just drop in here too. Spoiler alerts throughout the whole series, guys. If you haven't read the book, <laughs> yeah. we're going to totally ruin it for you. So there's your warning. Um, maybe it would be a little bit helpful for the audience if we could describe some of the characters, who they are, what's happening, and then how the, the main character in the story actually is interacting with the book itself in a way. So... Both Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and Leela um, use a similar kind of literary device, which is where it's a met it's a meta narrative where it blends the real world with a fictitious world. So in the first book, it's about a motorcycle journey across America with um, the the writer who refers to himself as as Phaedrus, which is a is a reference to Plato, and his son Chris. Um, and they're you know on a motorbike, and in Leela, it's um, a, a figure called the captain who refers to Phaedrus, um, and there's a there's a thematic reason for that which we'll go into, but it's about a, a guy who is is ostensibly the same character from the first book, but this time he's going down the river on a boat, and he has a shipmate that he picks up in the first chapter called Leela, who is this. Um, very dynamic, dynamic being a key word here, kind of chaotic figure, which completely frazzles all of his kind of static, let's say routines and patterns. And Piersig, who is to some degree making a fictitious version of himself in the book, um, describes how the journey down the river on this boat that he's, that he's living on with this character he, he uses it as a literary device to, to explain the difference between um, what he calls static quality, which is, um, let's say, like the blockchain in, in, in Bitcoin, that it's the, 
it's the all of the patterns that have been developed over in the past and then and then ordained or or turned into um fractal self-sustaining patterns that we don't even consciously pay attention to and then dynamic quality is the source of those static patterns which is the dynamic cutting edge of reality when when and it's un, it's undefinable by it's very by its very nature it is god it is the experiences that we have no conception of that we need to find an intellectual framework to explain mm-hmm. and i would describe uh, maybe um to use the bitcoin analogy the actual sealed blocks are kind of the static quality whereas the tip of the chain which is trying to discover the solution to the mining algorithm puzzle and seal the current block is the dynamic process so there's the dynamic quality forging the static quality yes and um the purpose of the dynamic quality is exploratory to to to, as you said, the cutting edge of reality, right? It's pushed, yeah, carrying us forward in time. But then the yeah. static quality is it exists to prevent retrogression. Yes. So, and this can happen in Bitcoin as well, where you could have two blocks discovered simultaneously, or perhaps a fork in the chain, and it can even roll back a few blocks. But the more, the further back the block is in the chain, the more rigid and static it is to resist yeah. retrogression. Yes, so static quality would be a and let's let's use the word ledger because ledger is is a is a is a kind of metaphysical um, concept, and it can manifest in various. Uh, it has it can have properties that are all ledger properties, but they they manifest in different instantiations in different forms. So, in the case of Bitcoin, the ledger is is a, a decentralized set of data of previously um, let's say processed blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, but another form of ledger would be mythology. Another form of ledger would mm-hmm. be genetic code, mm-hmm. uh, DNA, mm-hmm. which is which is also the accumulated um, blockchain of millions of generations of of life forms testing out new concepts, and the ones that hold get, um, let's say, uh, ordained as the as the static um, kind of legacy of yeah. the, the organism up to that point. No. Yeah. Um, so, so dynamic quality is the exploratory instinct that is, is open to the divine and the divine is anything that has yet to, to, to have been discovered. And, um, and we can go into the, the etymology and the sort of more, let's say mythological aspect of that at some point. And the static quality would be the having discovered the, dynamic quality how that dynamic quality is somehow preserved in a form that means it is not forgotten and can be utilized um, without regression like you say so when we make a leap forward with something we have to make sure that we record it somehow so that we don't forget it so Mm -hmm. in the case of morality we used stories stories were the ledger that were easily transmissible across generations which is why so much of our moral tales are encoded in um, in folklore and simple songs, mm-hmm. uh, because we're utilizing the most salient format of, yes. of let's say, data encoding yeah. and compression that can be easily given across generations yeah. and not forgotten. So epic poems, er- exactly. Lyrics, so yeah. So if we if we've got a culture that's or a community or a tribe that survived for hundreds of generations, then it will see across those generations, um, let's say, pragmatic patterns of action that have led to, uh, you know, have led to um, huge benefits for the tribe across mm-hmm. generations. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, there will have been some kind of understanding of big mistakes that have been made in the actions right. of the tribe that have led to chaos yes. and in order to avoid future generations from experiencing the chaos or the or the tragedy and yeah. in order to promote the idea of, of the best outcome you would encode in such a way that it would be transmissible and understandable at an, on a deeply unconscious level what those patterns of actions were so that the future generation doesn't have to make the same mistakes so yes. 
static quality is, let's say, the operations manual of previous consciousness at previous stages in time. Yeah, so it's dynamic quality, the exploratory and exploratory impulse of discovery. And then static quality is going to be the ossification of those discoveries into knowledge or some preservational structure such that future generations can can stand upon it effectively. And the, indeed, this is the way civilization grows, right? It's like we are contending with the scarcity of nature. The more knowledge we obtain and manifest in the form of capital, the more we can create uh, a protective barrier between us and the chaos of nature. And so civilization is the expansion of that anti-entropic bubble. Yes, yes. And when, and if there are any, let's say, you know, uh, bad actors within a community that, that, that break the, let's say the, the collective rule system that is encoded in those moral fables, then we call those things sin or vices because right. um, they are inherently counterproductive to the well-being of the communal organism. Just give a brief idea of what's going on in the fictional narrative and then how that fictional narrative is then connected to the metaphysical body of knowledge the main character is creating. So there's kind of a bridge between the fictional and the non-fictional through the main character. So, so in the story, the story starts in a, in a bar on the river and uh, the, the captain is who's is a literary figure which is the author and the author in this story is robert piercing because the other characters are referencing the success of the the author's previous book yes so they are actually referring to him as the great author who's had success with this book release and and uh while in the bar with these two other characters one's called richard rigel and another's called bill capella who um who have specific functions in the book, which we'll talk about in depth at some point. Um, they're having a, a beer in the bar and they're talking about their journey towards the, the, the open ocean. So they're going down the, the river system in, uh, in East America. So they're, they're on the Hudson, um, heading towards New York. Um, and at this opening chapter of the book, Richard Rigel is going to New York to sell his boat and the captain, the author, Robert Piercig, um, who has an internal character that's part of his consciousness called Phaedrus. And I should just mention that now because yep. in both books, Phaedrus is a subcomponent of the, the author's personality. Yes. And the reason that he's a subcomponent is, is there's multiple reasons. The first reason is that he was diagnosed when he was electro, you know, given electroconvulsion in the, in the, the late sixties and early seventies was that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, so technically speaking, by the, the letter of the medical law, he's schizophrenic. Um, but it's also because after his electroconvulsion, Roy Biersig talked about the importance of hiding aspects of his own personality from the world. So having an in someone to have an internal dialogue with, and he named that character, that sub-character Phaedrus, which is a reference to Plato, um, because Plato um, has a dialogue uh, with uh, a character called Phaedrus, and the idea being that it's it's a kind of counterpoint to the to the philo 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 philosophizing of of Robert Piercig. It's mm -hmm. like his internal, it's his internal character that he converses with, and he considers Phaedrus to be the one that went insane, and Phaedrus was the one that saw everything that mm. sent him catatonic. And Phaedrus is this disembodied figure that that uh, is not of this world. So Phaedrus is is basically the the higher entity in his mind. Well, so the um, meta narrative is like there's the fiction contained within the nonfiction contained within his actual life. It's incredible. Yes, so it's it, it's fractal as hell, man. I've uh, uh, God, I think I told you, I read this book eight times, and every time I read it, it's like <laughs> Jesus Christ. Then the last time. 
the last we'll go into some lit literary easter eggs which which blew my mind when i started researching the the book even more in depth was realizing that there are easter eggs that no one has ever recognized that mm -hmm. piercing dropped breadcrumbs which lead to down deep deep rabbit holes mm -hmm. into astronomy into astrophysics it's just mm -hmm. insane mm -hmm. and mythology hindu mythology so anyways, he's he's on this he's in this bar with these other people on, who have a different boat. He's traveling down the the, the river, and he, his intention is to hit the open ocean and get away from from the river and get out of the the locks and and hit hit the the wide the wide horizon, as it were. And on this first night, uh, a woman comes into the bar, who's called Leela Blewett, and uh, she is an old friend of Richard Rigel. And she is effectively, she's in her mid to late thirties and she is a chaotic, but highly dynamic force of nature. Um, you know, sexualized, um, slightly crazy, um, off kilter. And as the story progresses, you learn that her history also includes a dead child, mm -hmm. um, which, mm -hmm only now has just hit me that might be a internalization of piercing's um mm -hmm. kind of journey and he they have sex on the first night and then the story moves on that robert piercing uses leela as a as a character to explore the nature of insanity sexuality value and he uses her because in the book one of the first questions that he's he's given uh, by Richard Rigel, who who uh, basically says that Leela is is just stay away from Leela, she's bad news. And Richard Rigel, after the next morning, when he finds out that Piercing has slept with Leela, asks her asks him the question, kind of condescendingly, you know, Mister Great Author, who has who has written a book about the nature of quality, can you say to me? That the woman you slept with last night has quality you know you know you hypocrite you know you talk mm -hmm. about quality and all these lofty terms in philosophy mm -hmm. but then you go and bang some chick at the bar mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. boat when you're both drunk you know answer the question what is quality and does she have it and his answer is yes she has quality even though the whole first chapter basically describes how this woman's a mess mm -hmm. for various reasons um and then she becomes a, an almost like a an object of uh kind of let's say philosophical exploration amused. yeah amused she's amused yeah. yes exactly yeah. she is amused and yeah. and she causes piercing or she she's used for piercing to try and interpret because one of the things that he was puzzled with after the first book was that while he had talked in abstract terms about how the west and the east have different views on the world and he had he had explored so much about the nature of quality, but he hadn't given any practical guide for how that could be utilized for moral action. So he was basically like, well, I've talked about quality, but people can read the book and they don't, they're none the wiser as to how they can utilize quality in their lives. Mm. So what's the point of knowledge if you can't act with it, you know? So as he goes through this journey or down, down towards New York with Leela, um, he's trying to answer the question of, if I can't utilize a knowledge of quality to, to make any kind of clear statement about whether this person across from me has quality or not, then what's the point of talking about it? Right. Right. And that's, and, and then Leela becomes, he, he uses the expression that, you know, um, metaphysics of quality can explain Leela in such a way where you can realize that the question is ill-conceived yes. and that you need to, you need to re word the question in order for it to have any pragmatic value because it's too big a question but it gives us yes. that his metaphysics of quality allows for the principles you need to break the question apart he uses the example in zen in zen cohen that sometimes when you ask a zen buddhist a question their response will be mu as in mm -hmm. mu mm -hmm. and it simply means yes or no is not going to answer the question because the answer the question itself is false <laughs> right, right so right. in other words it's a dumb question so it shouldn't get an answer you need to re you need to re rethink the question in order to yeah. get anything useful out of it um, yeah and I, another thing I, I 
I think it's a great intro to the fictional side of the book. Um, I, I want to read a small excerpt here where he's actually introducing Leela. Um, because another thing that happened is he he separates Leela the individual from Leela the the dynamic quality or idea or concept or principle that she represents. Um, so I think this excerpt sort of zeroes in on that. It says, quote, there is Leela, this single private person who slept beside him now, who was born and now lived and tossed in her dreams and will soon enough die. And then there is someone else, call her Leela, who is immortal, who inhabits Leela for a while and then moves on. The sleeping Leela he had just met tonight, but the waking Leela, who never sleeps, had been watching him and he had been watching her for a long time, unquote. Yeah. So this, yeah, she yeah. Am amused, I guess is the, the best word for it, is he had had this um, question or, or in inquiry in his mind for a long time. And now he found this manifestation of uh, a, a way to explore that question in this woman. Um, and yes. the other, yeah. One of the things I think is really important I'd like to introduce here is that they're sailing, right? Most of this book, and this is back to Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. He's on a, a countrywide motorcycle tour with his son. Mm. This is, it's set in a backdrop of freedom and open exploration. And um, I think that's just very important. Uh, and, and so I want to read one more excerpt that describes that. And he's describing sailing itself. He says, quote, I think what we're buying with these boats is space, nothingness, emptiness, huge sweeps of open water, and sweeps of time with nothing to do. That's worth a lot of money. You can't hardly find that stuff anymore, unquote. So there's something about this uh, whole exploration of the broadest possible topic, metaphysics, occurring in a physical setting of the broadest possible space oftentimes mm. which is out on the open water um, mm. i found it to be not only enjoyable from a literary standpoint just the, him actually describing the sailing and whatnot but very uh relevant and and congruent even to the overarching metaphysical narrative hey everybody as you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. Yeah, so over time, I, you know, obviously working in film, my job is to is to work with with poly step, what we call polysemic mechan mechanisms, which is that we we make sure that any event in a story has multiple um, la like levels of analysis. So. Mm. It should it should be interpretable as something literal, as something met, as something metaphorical, or something allegorical, and in order for it to be allegorical, it needs to be a much deeper principle than just what you think you're watching on the screen. Mm -hmm. So, I use you know the example a lot of Jurassic Park, which is written by David Kep. And uh, Jurassic Park, if you ask anybody on the street, they'll say it's about a theme park filled with dinosaurs. But those are all just instruments or or, or tools for the storyteller. Um, the actual story allegorically is preparing for parenthood um, mm. and the events that unfold on this theme park for, for uh, filled with, with dinosaurs are challenges and questions about the nature of responsibility for creating life, yeah. um, which is why all the dinosaurs are artificially created life forms and, 
you know, the, the, the creator of those life forms is John Hammond, who sees himself as a God and he's got a God complex. Yeah. And, and you've got Alan and Ellie and they, they have to learn the, the responsibility of looking after children when these, you know, these dinosaurs get out of the cage. But there's, there's multiple levels of analysis. And with Piersig, I think he's underappreciated, underappreciated with, if he does his job well, you don't even notice. And, right. and his yeah. devices that he uses in both books uh, relate to the underlying theme, which is the idea that all evolution and all consciousness strives towards expanding its freedom. Yes. To, yes. You know, and it's it's what it's what we talk about with Bitcoin. It's freedom maximalism. Yes. It is it is freeing yourself from the restrictions of any kind of mechanism which reduces your own sovereign um, choices. Yes. Yes. No, I think it's a great great point that you've given a very good talk on the, the the archetypes underlying jurassic park i'll link to that in the show notes for sure because i know when we got introduced um that i found that to be very compelling very very enjoyable and to, yeah to your point it's it's the archetypes that are laden in this book or i i don't know if it's archetypes necessarily or it's symbolic language um or what, what was the term you used polysemic Polysemic. So it's, it's, it's a Greek term, which is when you can look at a scenario and a story and see it. And, and it can mean it can have truth seen through yes. two completely opposite viewpoints. Right. A, a, a great example of polysemic storytelling is Shutter Island. Uh, okay. I love I don't it, know if you've yeah. seen. Yeah. So the first time you watch it, you come in it with the view that, spoiler alert, Leonardo DiCaprio oh. is the police investigator and everyone on the island is corrupt and there's a conspiracy. Yeah. And it makes sense. It's true. Yeah. Every event is true in your perception. Uh -huh. But then the second time you view it, you realize that that he's nuts and everyone is basically indulging him. Yeah. And then you realize that that's also true. Yes. And you can watch the story in both lenses. Yes. And both is true with a lowercase t. Th and this, both, con both contains within it an uppercase t truth. This reminds me, another spoiler alert, the movie, The Life of Pi. The, the young boy uh, has a shipwreck, loses his family. He's stuck on a lifeboat with a tiger and, a, you know, there's a monkey and all of that. And so you watch this whole, you know, epic tale of survival. And then you find out it's, it's a guy telling the story at the end of the book. Um, that ended up being a story he was telling about cannibalism or effectively he was stuck on this lifeboat with other people and he told himself this story to cope with it. And so you can, you can interpret it either way when you break away from subject object duality person in the book makes a point. You don't need a single capital T truth necessarily. You can actually have, you can entertain these multiple. Um, yes. Refractions yes. Of truth. And, a, and actually that's, that's a centrally uh, of, of central importance to the entire metaphysics of quality because what it states is something which is unifying in our current world system, which is that there is no rock solid objective value system and there is no rock solid subjective value system. There is the middle way mm -hmm. and you cannot just disregard objective reality as if it doesn't exist because right. there, are, there are in fact from, from higher, let's say higher perspectives of conscious complexity, which is what humans are. Yeah. Um, Yes, looking at lower conscious levels is deterministic mm -hmm. because to their us. Pat to us, yes. their patterns of um, behavior are probabilistically predictable. Yes, to such a degree that they may as well be causal. But we know at the quantum level that's actually not true. It's actually not deterministic. It's probabilistic. It just appears deterministic at our level of analysis. Yeah. Exactly the the. With all of the the, the the various complexities happening on aggregate, they end up being as good as predictable uh, to the point where you can make laws about them right. that are, you know, reliable enough. Reliable yeah. enough. Yeah. But as with all laws, their 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 let's say pragmatic use case um, has boundaries. Yes. Say general theory of relativity, you know. That all works until you go too small or too big. Yeah. So it's it's about pragmatic application, and that's where value comes in, which is 
when and why is this idea true? Right. So, so you need the participatory conscious being to make decisions about action. Pragmatism being a big subject here, we, we may as well set up the idea of, it's a theme in the book, the American pragmatists, William James. Mm. And, and he talks about uh, this idea of what is truth. And he says, he uses the example of a group of philosophers, uh, William James and some friends um, are watching a squirrel run around a tree. Mm-hmm. And uh, they set the challenge of like, if you run, a, like if you set the challenge of yourself, run around, around the squirrel, but if the squirrel runs around the tree, as you're running 360 around the tree itself, do you ever go around the squirrel? Because mm-hmm. technically, its orientation to you is always maintained yeah. across the whole circuit. Yeah. But if you say, well, the, the question is posed in relation to the um, to the the axis of the planet, then yes, you have, yes. you have gone around him. The question then becomes, which map right. gives the most pragmatic truth for the purposes at hand? Yes, yes. So, so then the question is, no, what is it? What's Nassim Taleb's uh, statement? Um, no models are true, some are useful. Yeah, some are useful, most are dangerous. And this also, the author also makes this point that he's actually not throwing out subject-object duality. No. He's saying that subject-object duality is like the rectangular coordinates to metaphysics of qualities, polar coordinates. So it depends on your circumstances. In fact, like if you're at the North pole, you want polar coordinates. <laughs> yes. The only map else, to use. Yeah. If yeah. you're anywhere else, you want rectangular coordinates. So it's, de- it's context dependent. It's like, if you use a map that successfully navigates you from a to B, mm. is that because the map was true or because the map was useful? Yeah. Right back, back to this concept conception of the American pragmatist that lower T truth manifests itself to us in utility effectively. Like when something's useful, it's true for all practical purposes. Um, and just one on the middle way, I think that's a great way to look at it. What comes to mind there is the middle way between the subjectively subjective, which you could say is the realm of relativism right? Where two plus two equals five, nothing means anything. Everything's relative to everything else. There's no accident. Postmodern feelings govern yeah, everything. Post- yeah. mo- postmodern. Yeah. All of that. And then the other end of the spectrum, we have the objectively objective, which is just this valueless totalitarian command and control, absolute, um, the totalizing of knowledge effectively right like we have figured everything out there's nothing else to discover or explore you follow these commands that's it no more questions pure answers yeah and the point is i don't want to say it's the point but the case persic is making is there is a middle way between the two that is in fact the right way which goes back to the taoist philosophy of the middle way you know it's like yeah um, yeah so I, I want to, I, we're, we're meandering again, which is great, but I do want to zero in on the main character. He's on this boat. He's with his muse, Leela. Yeah. He's writing the book that we're reading. <laughs> yeah. Presumably. Yes. I don't know if he ever, oh I don't God, know if he ever calls so it out, but he is, so it's the, so he is himself. The author is himself, although he's not naming himself, but he's being praised yeah. for his past work which yeah. is ostensibly Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, although it's not named. He's writing yeah. a current book about metaphysics yeah. of which this book is about. And he's describing how he's writing this book in detail, his card cataloging system of uh, accumulating and assembling these ideas into a useful order. He talks about that true to the metaphysics of qualities kind of underlying principle it's about the pursuit of betterness in any situation so utility so truth is truth is defined by the utility that it it offers in in the in the you know whatever predicament you're in the american pragmatist sense of truth yeah yes exactly and and what they what they didn't necessarily what they didn't have the american pragmatists was a categorical exhaustive framework through which you could say 
in this category of, of um, patterns of value, mythological morality is more true than scientific realism, like materialism, because, mm. you know, it, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm segueing, or I'm just going to segue briefly mm-hmm. uh, before we go into the cataloging card system. Mm-hmm. Um, Piercing talks, he, he also used to write technical manuals for computers back in the day. And he talks about the idea of, of how you can, for your, you know, use the most powerful microscope in the world to interrogate a magnetic hard drive. Mm-hmm. You're never going to see the data that is encoded within it because right. the magnetic, novel on the hard drive. Yeah. The, yeah, the novel that's stored as data on the hard drive is not in a format that the physical microscope can even interpret. Right. So to you can in, increase the power of the microscope until you're blue in the face. Yes, it's never going to be in the format of of perception that would allow yes. it to see it. And even if it could see it, it wouldn't necessarily understand the I, rules of the person that wrote the code. I think even so, describes with the oscilloscope where you can see the electromagnetic patterns, you still can't find the text of the novel and the electromagnetic it, patterns. Exactly, yeah. you need various tiers of interpretation, including the code language, which yes. is an in- intellectual pattern of values in order to decode the physical pattern of values that are encoded yes. on the hard drive. So yeah. there's this interlocking aspect about utility of value of mm-hmm. truth as it were but going to the card the card system he talks about how he wrote the metaphysics of quality by using a um, random access memory system mm-hmm. of a card tray or many card trays and while he was trying to solve a problem obviously creating a metaphysics from scratch is a pretty big task he said that he simplified it with a simple principle which is uh, if you've got a problem, you hold up a, a card and then you wait for a question to come up and then you say, does the question come before or after this card? And you put the question down and then you answer that question. And if the answer comes, you know, th- is it more important or less important than the card in front of it? And then you, he slowly built out progressively yeah. this metaphysics by asking questions of, you know, asking a question about can value be in an object? And then you then you come up with an answer. Well, no, because the subject is what perceives the the value. So maybe the value is in the subject. Is the value in the subject? If it was, you know, um, then everyone would have a different uh, value for different objects. So that can't be true. So value can't be in the subject. The hot stove is objectively low value, right? (laughs) Exactly. Pragmatically, you put your hand on a hot stove. Everyone's going to bloody agree that. It's, it's a low value situation yeah. before they intellectualize it. They're right. just like, yeah, this is a low value predicament. Yeah. Yeah. Their biology tells them that. Yeah. So he came up with this card system, which I think is based on the, he talks about how the Dewey decimal system was. Yeah, I'll, was, I'll read was, this, this one excerpt here um, that might answer and, and give you some fuel here. So he says, quote, some of the slips were actually about this topic, random access and quality. The two are closely related. Random access is at the essence of organic growth in which cells like post office boxes are relatively independent. Cities are based on random access. Democracies are founded on it. The free market system, free speech and the growth of science are all based on it. A library is one of civilization's most powerful tools precisely because of its card catalog trays. Without the Dewey Decimal System allowing the number of cards in the main catalog to grow or shrink at any point, the whole library would soon grow stale and useless and die, unquote. Yeah. We should just read the book out. Like, it's yeah. just, I mean, my God, this guy. This Which guy. It makes me think that the, the most powerful feature of a computer is the, ra- the RAM, the random access memory, right? It's this. Yes, um, yes. Well, it's, it's, it's the combination of both, right? Because it has the, the hard drive for storing vast amounts of static yes. uh, of data, yes. but it's the, it's the program itself, which can, which is, is coded in such a way that it has random access capabilities that can move around like right. hyperlink and hypertext, right. like in the Bible, yes. Yes. dynamically, it can move around things. Yes. Um, and that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, it's, the, the capacity to not be locked into anything rigid, which once again, the Dewey Decimal System is, an, is a dynamic discovery of a freedom enabling methodology. Mm. 
So random access memory is, is an expression of freedom. Right. In the, in the exploration of data and storage of data and reconfiguration of data and reconfiguration of inf information. So it's, yes. it is a dynamic ability to, to, to reorganize information. And like Peterson says, in formation, finding the formation right. is, is, is the whole point. That's right. the pursuit of truth, right? Morality is finding the formation. Yeah. So random access memory allows for the reconfiguration of the formation. Yeah. And it's back to this middle way, right? Between static and dynamic is you need both to really construct meaning, right? Like we're talking about the base level of the computer would be, what did, what did he call them? The flip-flops. I think there's ones or zeros. They're gateways that are letting electricity through or not. It's just binary. And then that filters up through one keyhole or one little aperture to the base level language. Yeah. Um, Fortran, Fortran or Fortran. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so then that language is so rudimentary that most programmers are writing in a higher language. They don't even understand the base level language, much, much less the flip flops. Like the, the, the programmers at the physical level need no knowledge of the higher levels and vice versa. The higher level programmers need no knowledge of it below it, but they're all critically dependent and interlocked, interlinked, as you said. And yeah. the hot, the highest level would be the application. Like if you're actually writing a book on a word processor, uh, yeah. I guess you could say it goes one level out too into the English language, right? The, the application's rendering the English language to you. And that's something else that has to be understood to interpret the book. The question is, oh, it's too big a subject because we're, we're going to cover, <laughs> we're going to cover this at some point. It goes beyond Leela, but the idea that are the ideas are there two ends of a spectrum here that are trying to attract each other and meet in the middle? Are uh, is the concepts that exist in the in the in the oh man? It's, let's come back to that. But effectively, yeah. yes, the idea that there is languages in the intellectual patterns that are trying to reach down and manifest themselves—it's it's earth, heaven, and earth. Yes, ideas are heaven, and they want yeah. to instantiate themselves in the physical domain. Yes. and the physical domain is 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 meeting it in the middle yes. and transmutating itself towards the heaven, which as random as that sounds, goes back to what we talked about a few weeks ago, that the actual Sanskrit of God and the son of God does not mean the offspring of, of the king. God in Sanskrit is good, which is exchange. So the idea that you have this exchange between... Uh, you know the flip flops and the and the Fortran and the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the and the, the the binary code that's written yes. into the operating system and the operating system into the word document and the word document into the novel. Yes, it's all exchange. It's exchange of 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 consciousness somehow between the ideal of heaven and the the mundane of physical matter. Right, and the the the, the in the intensity of exchange is increasing at each layer. Right, so. It's it's there's less exchange occurring at lower layers. The intensity of exchange and complexity increases at higher layers, but that also creates more wealth of meaning, if you will. So this is very comparable to an economy where the more intent the more you intensify free exchange, the more wealth is created as a result. There's a very direct. I mean, it's it's mind blowing, honestly. It's like we we. Again, that principle itself being embodied in human action at one layer is also embodied fully or instantiated fully at this level of computer architecture, right? From the software layer all the way down into the hardware layer. So talk about a principle existing at multiple levels of reality. I mean, nothing could be more important almost than this concept of exchange. And it's fascinating to me that the etymological roots of the word God are, is it Gut, G-H-U-T? G-H-U-T. Which means good or exchange. It means and, to barter or exchange. And not, so it's, the, it's the trade. It's the active trade. It's the participatory trade. Yes. That's Mutual, what good mutualistic means. Mutualistic, voluntary trade in accordance with one's value systems yeah. um, is, is the root of the word God. And I will not ruin the end of the book, but I think this is a very important point to keep in mind when we get to the end of the book. 
you know, you and I got in contact about six or seven months ago. Uh, I I first watched your material with um, the number zero, Bitcoin, the number zero, and reached out without any particular, it's like the whitehead quote, you know, with with a with a dim awareness of you know mm-hmm. what what exactly we were going to get out of the conversation. But I think that what is coalescing the more we share Leela and and Bitcoin and the Sailor series, and I think it's the awareness that. Jordan Peterson as a sort of cultural uh, touchstone that, like he says, why are people watching a, an old psychology professor talk about the Bible on YouTube? Right. You know, right. why are people talking about Bitcoin? Why are, why are we talking about this book about Lila? And I think I think you encapsulated it when you talked about your Trinity, which is maps of meaning, action by Mises and and human and action, Isik, human action by Mises yep. and, and values all of them relate to the core principle of existence, which is how to value and how to act. Yes. That's it. That's it. There's nothing else. Which science can teach us nothing about. Which science can teach us nothing about. And the accumulated, um, let's say the accumulated encyclopedia of all action at all levels of, of consciousness and evolution is encapsulated in the word morality. Yeah. Yes. Cells have morality. Red blood cells have morality. When they value picking up oxygen and dropping off carbon dioxide, that's their morality. Right. And that's a very low bandwidth exchange of just yes. one thing. But then they accumulate into a huge community of yeah. other cellular life that in totality is Robert Breedlove. Yes. And then Robert Breedlove is contributing to the massive complexity of the community of an organism of the earth and the earth is now is now contributing to this digital um ecosystem that is above our comprehension you know Um, all we know is that morality is is the operations manual for valuing and acting in life and this recursive sequence of morality we know from the evolutionary biologist morality emerges from play actually so peterson often talks about the emergent morality among wolves yeah where if there's a dispute among the alpha males the loser will just give up his neck the alpha Mm. male will kill him because turns out you might need the whole wolf pack to bring down the moose the next day so morality emerges from play play emerges from freedom Yes, yes. And the whole pursuit of this whole recursive operation is towards higher freedom for the highest layer of static quality. Yeah. Right. So we're constantly trying to create new layers, free lower layers to create higher layers to build a foundation yeah. on on which to pursue even higher freedom for subsequent layers. Yes, yes. And once we've created um uh, let's say a layer of static quality that gives us freedom over time it will transform itself as we progress into its own prison for right. our freedom because yes. while it initially gives us freedom it will also prohibit us from evolving to the next level of freedom which goes into the idea that that there is no such thing as evil everything is the result of of, of god because God in creating, you know, the, in, in, the, in the act of exchange, we create systems that support us that eventually cripple us and we have to escape them. We have to generate the systems that will eventually prohibit us from progressing and escape yes. them too. And then and it goes into the, you know, I, I love movies because they're lies that tell a deeper truth. All stories are. All um, languages all languages yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's no truth well like we talked about truth none of they're just yeah. approximation truth, truth is beyond words capital t truth is beyond words so all language is a lie yeah yes all language is a lie that tells yeah. a, a deeper truth yeah. you know or alludes to a deeper truth which is it. art right art's telling lies to point to the truth kind of thing yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly art is creative play Art is yes. creative play it's dynamic right. play with no right. static goals and no no objective um endpoint right um, but going back to this idea of of the freedom um dynamic of dynamic creation creates the conditions for enhanced freedom and that enhanced freedom eventually becomes the the structure that prohibits us from finding new levels of freedom because we've become lost in it mm-hmm. and it you know it becomes static 
and it's that's encapsulated in the dark night when um when they have a discussion about the nature of of responsibility for gotham in the context of uh, julius caesar which is the the emperor that took responsibility but then never gave up his power mm-hmm. and and uh, harvey dent says you either die a, die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain mm-hmm. which is a perfect metaphorical encapsulation of dynamic and static quality. If you idolize static quality, you become totalitarian. Right. If you idolize the unknowable, you become spiritual. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mystical. Right. I think it's Myst- myst- calls it. mystical. Yeah. This yes. calls to mind the quote from young Pueblo it says, make sure that the walls you build to protect yourself do not become a prison. And that's essentially what's happening, right? Is where the dynamic, quality ossifies into it either dies a hero or it ossifies to become a new static layer on which that then needs to be escaped for dynamic quality to again become exploratory 